All right, welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to be doing a sample lecture out of one of the introductory courses for remote sensing in the Department of Geography uh, 271, which is Earth from Space Remote Sensing. You might note that my first slide here is, it says Intro to Synthetic Aperture Radar, Remote Sensing and Applications. This is just one of the examples of uh, one of the topics that we cover in Geography 271. So this image I wanted to show because it is a good example of what we can glean from synthetic aperture radar. Uh, we are looking at the Canary Islands, the island of the city of Santa Cruz in Tenerife, which is on the southeast of the image in purple and white. And then using radar technology, we can also look at different types of land cover. So we see purple, which is uh, vegetation, and then green, which is actually um, lava flow is coming from the volcano in the central part of the island. So with that said, I'll do a quick introduction on myself and then we'll get going. So who am I? I'm Dr. Grant Gunn. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management. Um, my research field uh, is the remote sensing of cold regions. So I look at using remote sensing to quantify parameters of snow, freshwater lake ice, sea ice, and then I dabble a little bit in crop sequences as well in terms of agriculture. Uh, fun fact is I am a hockey nut. I love the Leafs, uh, so I'm also a glutton for punishment. So I just want to give a couple examples of some of the research that takes place in the Department of Geography. Uh, the first is a GIF, uh, a video of myself in cold regions. So this is um, blowing snow, blustery conditions, in a transitional tundra environment. Um, and if you decide to join the Department of Geography or the faculty environment in a undergraduate or going into a graduate role, um, field experience is of the utmost um, uh, possibility that you can join. So that's one example I wanted to show. Another piece is looking at the importance of lakes and freshwater in North America. And this is just an image showing all of the lakes um, included in the Hydro Sheds Lake project. Um, and a lot of my work has to do in the areas just north of um, the Canadian Shield, where a lot of these lakes are sitting on top of the, the open bedrock and um, are very important to monitor uh, climate. So the next example I wanna show is some field research that we did on sea ice in the Northwest Passage. And this is an example of um, radar owned by the university that we've taken up to a Resolute and tried to quantify uh, sea ice properties uh, in the uh, transitional season between freeze or sorry, from melt onset to uh, um, break up. Okay, so moving on, um, I'd like to do an introduction of um, basic for remote sensing. So what is it? So in layman's terms, remote sensing is the collection of data about an object without physically touching that object. So a good example of that, uh, that, that is a good analogy is your eyeball. You're getting, gleaning information about the color of an object, the texture, how far it is away from you, all using uh, information without touching that object. Remote sensing is the same thing. We're opening an aperture and measuring uh, how much radiation is coming from that target at a specific wavelength. So there's different types of remote sensing. Um, we're gonna deal with one today looking at microwaves, but we have many different platforms in which we view data from. The first being ground-based platforms. We saw a sled on the sea ice. Uh, there's many different types of ground-based platforms, including what's shown here is LIDAR. And so we're uh, using light and millions of data points to produce 3D images or 3D reconstructions of targets. Another observation type or platform is looking at airborne platforms. And this is an example of a course that uh, went out into the area surrounding Columbia Lake, launched a balloon and actually collected and stitched together uh, optical images of Columbia Lake. And that was just a, a lab that you might do if you join the department. So the next platform I want to talk about is spaceborne platforms. These are images that are collected on satellites that have been launched as early as 1968 all, all the way through 2021. Um, we can collect data from a wide range of frequencies looking at optical all the way through microwave. And the example here we're showing is 
optical data collected from the MODIS satellite, which is a NASA product. We can collect data in the daytime when clouds are present or when clouds are free of the, uh, the Earth's surface, or we can collect data at nighttime. And this is an example of looking at uh, thermal imaging um, showing the urban heat island effect of cities. So the beginning of remote sensing, what was taught to me was remote sensing is can generate many beautiful images, but remote sensing isn't just pretty pictures. We're gonna look at a few quick uh, applications uh, to show the importance of remote sensing uh, throughout time. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty about synthetic aperture radar. So first we're looking at oceans. This is a El Nino year from 2009 and 2010, where we're monitoring surface height using radar from the satellite Jason, which is a, a NASA and a French space agency product. Another application is looking at a sea surface temperature anomaly. And this GIF shows uh, the 2015-16 El Nino, uh, which broke warming records in the Central Pacific. And this was measured by the advanced, sorry, the advanced very high resolution radiometer uh, uh, launched by NASA. Moving forward, we're, we can look at vegetation monitoring. And this video shows uh, the tracking of vegetation health using the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. There are a multitude of applications for this product, uh, not only looking just at vegetation health, but looking at greening up of the, uh, the Arctic. We can also look at uh, the distribution of crops all using this one product um, that can be applied from many different optical sources. Another application is looking at wildfire monitoring and the presence and the impact of wildfires can be monitored from air and spaceborne satellites, investigating the timing, frequency and severity of current fires and the vulnerability of regions to increases in wildfire occurrence. And this is an image that was captured by uh, NASA's Aster satellite. And finally, I wanted to, uh, to show how heat waves and heat islands can also be quantified using remote sensing. On the left panel here, we see anomalous heat in the Canadian high Arctic during the summer heat wave of 2020. And this was collected by the European Space Agency Sentinel-3 satellite. On the right, brings everything home to the human impact, showing urban heat islands from NASA's EcoStress product, showing that airports and city centers are hotter than surrounding regions because of their construction with surfaces that retain heat. Moving to the, the overall importance of remote sensing. Remote sensing allows for the measurement of physical media on Earth's surface for over 40 years with significant improvements in sensors, technologies, uh, revisit times and spatial resolution. Now we've come a long way since the early 1960s when the corona reconnaissance satellite dropped images and cassettes that had to be recovered by planes during their descent. Now we have images that are acquired and available in near real time with unprecedented data access and analysis capabilities. So going back to Geography 271, what's presented here? Well, we have six main topics. We look at image interpretation, optical remote sensing fundamentals, including visible light and infrared, then we move to thermal remote sensing, light detection and ranging, and then microwave remote sensing in both active and passive. Now, overall, this course is an introduction to the amazing world of remote sensing that we dive into in upper year courses as well. Okay, so getting into the nitty gritties of radar. There's two types of systems in remote sensing, a passive system, which records electromagnetic energy that's reflected or emitted from an external source, now, this is similar to how a camera on your phone records an image. It opens an aperture and lets radiation interact with the sensor, which then records that, that reflectance. In an active sense, the sensor payload actually carries its own source of electromagnetic radiation. And the typical characteristics of an active system are that it transmits energy towards a target surface. That energy interacts with a target, producing some form of backscatter or returned energy to the sensor. And then the returned energy is measured by a sensor, uh, whether it's in space, on the ground, or airborne. Now, we've come a long way in terms of radar and, and, and technological advances. 
On the left, we have a shortwave radar that could detect objects only about seven miles away. And this is important for um, when we had the defense of Britain, when uh, radar was really developed for the detection of airborne, uh, vessel, airborne vehicles, airplanes. <laughs> On the right, is a CTR system that's capable of providing highly accurate tracking data on non-cooperative targets, including rockets, missiles, artillery, and aircraft. And that all happened in the short period of 80 years. Now, all of this technological advancement meant that we didn't have to deal with advancing the ability of human ears to detect airplanes. And this is uh, a two-horn listening device at Bowling Field in Washington, DC in 1921. This was before the invention of radar to listen for distant aircraft. Aren't you glad that radar was invented so this wouldn't have to be your profession? Okay, let's rein it back into radar. What does radar mean? Well, it's radio or microwave detection and ranging. Essentially, it's a device that measures distance to an object. A transmitter generates a pulse of radiation focused by an antenna into a beam and then we measure the amount of returned energy, which is the intensity, as well as the time delay that it takes for that, um, that, that beam to return to the sensor, and that's the delay. The value that we're looking to uh, obtain is the backscatter, which is the portion of the transmitted signal that is returned from a target towards the receiving antenna. The primary advantages of using microwave remote sensing is that it's got a low frequency or a long wavelength. Now that penetrates clouds so that we can consider radar to be an all weather remote sensing system. It's independent of solar radiation as well as cloud cover. Now it can be operated at user specific times, which being day or night. And that means that it's a tasked satellite or it's a task sensor. And then it senses outside the visible and infrared range providing information on the surface roughness, electrical properties and moisture content of a target. And finally, because of all of these advantages, we can create synoptic views of large areas, which means that we can map cloud shrouded countries as well as large countries over a period of time. And this is a great example showing how we can use radar to uh, produce mosaics. And so this is a, 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 the scenes, the acquisitions from RadarSat1, which is a Canadian owned uh, synthetic aperture radar, which is since uh, being de decommissioned. Um, and these are all the acquisitions that were used to create a mosaic. And the mosaic is shown here of Antarctica. Um, it took three weeks to produce this image with 25 meter resolution of the entire Antarctic continent. It shows the shorelines, uh, outcropping of bedrocks, and the extent of glaciers. So we can, we know we can produce a mosaic, but how do we understand the radar target interactions so that we can actually retrieve information on those targets. So what influences the magnitude of returned energy to the sensor, which is termed as backscatter? There's two main properties that influence backscatter. The first being sensor properties, which we won't touch on here, and the second being target properties. So the two target properties that affect backscatter are surface roughness and electrical properties. So when we look at the surface roughness, Smooth surfaces tend to act as specular reflectors. Essentially, they're mirrors where they reflect, reflect energy away from the sensor. Rough surfaces act as diffuse reflectors, which means that it reflects a certain portion of, um, of microwaves back to the sensor. So it would be a moderate backscatter. And then uh, a corner reflector is where we have man-made objects where we have right angles formed both at the ground and at the building, where we have very high backscatter return to the sensor. So the other property that affects backscatter in terms of microwaves is the permittivity. And the permittivity describes the ability of, of materials molecules to become polarized when an electrical field or a microwave is applied to it. The complex per permittivity describes the potential for a material to transmit, reflect, and absorb microwave energy. Increases in permittivity results in the increased absorption of uh, the microwaves, which means lower backscatter. So let's look at something that I'm interested in researching, which would be freshwater ice using synthetic aperture radar. 
Now, typically I show this slide. This is my $20 slide to show the interactions of microwaves and freshwater ice. We have uh, snow overlying the ice, which is generally um, a transmission of microwaves. We don't have much interaction there. Then we have a surface layer of gray ice or white ice when we have um, interactions between the microwaves and the spherical bubbles within the ice. And then there's a bubble-free ice layer, which, is, uh, which transmits the large majority of microwaves through the layer, and then bubbled ice, which we have a high backscatter from. Now, this knowledge of the different target interactions in ice leads to the ability to produce um, the GIF that I'm showing here, which is Arctic sea ice extent acquired by QuickScat. The bright white ice is multi-year ice, where we have a large amount of rough surface roughness and uh, drained brine channels that cause corner reflection. And then the dark or grayish ice is actually first year ice, which has a lot of brine within the water, sorry, within the ice itself, which absorbs much of the incoming microwaves. And what we can see is this interplay between first year and multi-year ice, where we can track how much multi-year ice there is within any given year and produce long time series to track um, a changing climate. So remember this, um, the Antarctic mapping mission, it created a composite of RadarSat-1 acquisitions to produce 25 meter composite. What takes three or what took three weeks then takes minutes today. And I wanna give an example using Google Earth Engine, but first let me, uh, let me set up this example. So we're gonna be looking at ice cover in the Great Lakes, specifically in the Straits of Mackinac. Now, knowledge of ice conditions is paramount to the safety and resource allocation of ships and Coast Guard cutting vessels uh, during the shipping season, as well as the ice covered season. They have to plan routes, uh, they have to plan ship escorts, and they all require accurate ice cover information. We don't want um, ships to be moored in ice for long periods of time and ships that don't have uh, the strength and hulls to interact with ice cover. So we have to know where that is. That's the first bit. So we can also track where uh, ice is throughout the season, uh, right up to the opening of shipping season. So let's do this demonstration in Google Earth Engine. Okay, so this is the Google Earth Engine environment. Google Earth Engine allows us to access a repository or repositories of different remote sensing observations, including optical, um, thermal, as well as microwave observations. Today, we're gonna to be looking at two of those to demonstrate the capabilities of uh, Google Earth Engine compared to how we took three weeks to produce um, that mosaic of Antarctica. So in this code, I have Landsat and Sentinel data. The Landsat is the optical, the Sentinel data is the microwave. And all I'm doing is I'm creating a composite over a specific time period. We're looking at February 26th through March the 5th for Sentinel. And we're looking at a summertime uh, composite of reflectance data for the Landsat data. So if we run this code, we'll quickly see that we have both V8VV, which is a Sentinel radar product, the Crosspole VH, which is also a Sentinel radar product, and then we can composite those into a single image. Anywhere where you see yellow or white is areas of rafted or thick ice. Anywhere where you see a light blue would be very thin ice, and then very dark areas would be considered to be open water. Now we can classify this image so that we can actually identify where that ice extent is. And so we have to first identify where the land cover is as well, which is where we bring in a composite of Landsat optical imagery, which is loading here. And then we can classify using all the Landsat bands and the Sentinel bands into a specific classification, which will show you anywhere there's pink, that would be area where, there's, where the classification has deemed there to be ice, anywhere where there's brown, is where the open water exists, and then green and yellow would be land cover. Now we can also see that there's ice covered lakes on land as well. So this is a quick example to show just how powerful the cloud computing and technology we have uh, available to any person that wants to open it up today. There's also another example I wanna show of the Northwest Passage. We can create 
this composite very, very quickly within minutes. And this is something that would have taken, you know, uh, weeks, if not multiple weeks back in 1999 to the year 2000. So this is just two examples of technology we have available to us currently. All right, thanks for watching. If you have more questions about what you've learned today, you can reach out to me at my email on the slide, or you can learn more about our geography related programs at uwaterloo.ca slash gem. Thanks very much, everybody.